Broadmoor Psychiatric Hospital is a high security facility. It was originally built as an insane asylum. And while it's not a prison, many of those finding themselves within these walls do so via the legal system. For nearly a hundred years, these very high walls and fences were seen as enough security to protect the people outside from the potentially dangerous people held within. In 1952, a murderer by the name of John Straffen would prove otherwise. Not only would he escape, but he would also kill again. Before we begin, I'd like to thank today's sponsor, Murder by Choice. If you're like me, sometimes you're overcome with a desire to solve a crime. Well, now you can, and you can do it wherever you please. Murder by Choice is a murder mystery hidden object game wherein you play as Carla Page, a young journalist invited by a billionaire to his party on a mysterious island. Before the fun can begin, however, a murder occurs and Carla takes it upon herself to solve it. I found the story along with the beautiful artwork very compelling and the game is packed full of interactive content. You'll be solving puzzles, traveling across 50 locations and meeting a range of exciting characters. My favorite has to be the stylish Ruben, almost like a young me. How the story plays out is also entirely up to you as your choices shape how the story unfolds. So, Instead of doom scrolling across social media, why not dive into the mystery? Murder by Choice is free on iOS and Android and is available to download now. And if you use my link, you will get the gift of 500 free energy. This offer is valid until November the 11th, 2023. Simply click the link in the description box or scan the QR code on the screen to begin your adventure today. Born on February 27, 1930 in Borden, Hampshire, John Thomas Straffen spent the majority of his early childhood in India, where his father, a British Army soldier, was posted when John was just two years old. While his mother described him as an ordinary healthy boy, his speech developed slowly and he seemed to display other learning difficulties. After returning to England in 1938, the Straffen family settled in Bath, Somerset, where John quickly began to act up. At the age of eight, he was referred to a child guidance clinic due to his pilfering and class skipping habits. This seemed to have little effect as the following year, he stood before the juvenile court for stealing a purse from a young girl. While John was given two years probation, his probation officer, Sidney Harding went on to say he wasn't sure if the boy even understood what probation meant. During his career, Harding had dealt with numerous naughty boys, but there was something different in John Straffen. It was clear that his intelligence wasn't on the same level as other children of his age. He seemed to learn nothing at school, which isn't wholly unusual. However, it also seemed he had no understanding of the difference between right and wrong. There were challenges in working with the boy's mother, who had her hands full with taking care of John and his siblings in their crowded lodgings. So Harding decided to take the boy to be evaluated by a psychiatrist himself. At the time, under the Mental Deficiency Act of 1927, there were four different classes of mental defectiveness that in today's world are no longer correct medical terms. Idiots, imbeciles, moral defectives, and feeble-minded. The psychiatrist found that young John Straffen clearly fell into the last category. As feeble-minded, the boy was defined as a person in whose case there exists mental defectiveness, which though not amounting to imbecility is yet so pronounced that they require care, supervision, and control for their own protection or for the protection of others, or in the case of children, 
that they appear to be permanently incapable by reason of such defectiveness of receiving proper benefit from instruction in ordinary schools. A report from 1940 states that John had an IQ of 58, while the average was considered to be around 100. This meant that he had the mental age of a six-year-old at 10 years of age, the result being that he was sent to a residential school for, quote, mentally defective children. St. Joseph's School in Sanborn, Warwickshire. Although his teachers described him as an amenable, affectionate child, John himself said he hated school because he was sometimes punished. He seemed unable to make friends and didn't take discipline well, often sulking by himself if scolded. In 1946, at the age of 16, John returned home to Bath, where he was examined by a medical health officer who found him still certifiable under the Mental Deficiency Act. But John managed to evade being put under any supervision and instead set about living an independent life. After working several odd jobs, he was hired as a machinist in a clothing factory. But less than a year later, the teenager left his job as his life began to go off the rails. Strafford's penchant for taking things that didn't belong to him seemed to follow him into young adulthood. He began entering unoccupied homes and stealing items, not to sell, but to hoard and hide away. While these crimes were strange, they were not overtly harmful. This would soon change. In the summer of 1947, a 13-year-old girl contacted the police, telling them she had just been assaulted by an older boy named John. She told them he had put his hand over her mouth and chillingly asked, what would you do if I killed you? I have done it before. Despite having a name, police didn't initially link the incident to John Straffen. However, just weeks later, he would be arrested after it was found he had killed five chickens belonging to the father of a girl he had argued with. Such behaviour wasn't exactly new to John, who was suspected of strangling two prize geese owned by an officer at his school three years earlier. By this time, the authorities had also connected John to some of the burglaries and during an interview, the young man happily confessed to 13 more housebreaking offences. With this, he was quickly remanded in custody. There, Straffen was again psychiatrically examined and certified feeble-minded by the medical officer of Horfield Prison. As a result, he was committed to Hawtham Colony in Bristol under the Mental Deficiency Act of 1913. Opened in 1933, Hawtham could hold up to 600 people and was an institution that aimed to train and ultimately resettle mentally disabled offenders in the community. At the time, the Hawtham Colony authorities had no reason to suspect John was any danger to himself or others. After all, they only knew about the house breaking charges and the young man was well behaved and amenable during his time in the institution. This led to Straffen being transferred to a low security hospital in Winchester. While the good behaviour he had shown at Hawtham seemed to initially carry over, John's apparent kleptomania soon resurfaced and he was found to have stolen a bag of walnuts. This and other setbacks to his progress led to Straffen returning to Hawtham in February of 1950. Having spent nearly three years in the system, he would decide he'd had enough in August of the same year when he left the colony without permission and returned home. When the police arrived to take him back, he refused to go with them and an altercation ensued. He would eventually be returned to Hawtham, but by 1951, John was considered sufficiently rehabilitated and was eventually released under license into his mother's care. Being under license meant if he did anything wrong or if the authorities felt it necessary, he could be returned to Hawthorne. After turning 21, John's situation was reassessed, with it being decided that his certification should continue for a further five years. 
Draffen's family disputed this outcome, successfully achieving a term of no more than six months with a view to discharge at the end. But John, who at this point was evaluated to have the mental capacity of a 10-year-old, wasn't happy. He resented authority and wanted to cut all strings with those who had controlled him. He also wanted revenge on the police, who he saw as the source of his troubles. On the same day that John had been examined by Dr. Weston, the body of a young girl, Christine Butcher, was discovered in Windsor. She had been strangled with the belt of her own raincoat. It's been speculated that John heard about the case and was intrigued by how much trouble the horrific crime was causing the authorities he deeply despised. This sparked a sinister idea in the young man's mind, one he would quickly act upon. On July the 16th, 1951, while making his way to a local cinema, Straffen saw five-year-old Brenda Goddard picking flowers in her foster parents' garden in Camden Crescent, Bath. He approached the little girl, telling her he knew a better place where she could find flowers. Perhaps it was John's childlike manner that was enough to convince the five-year-old to let the stranger lift her over a fence and into a nearby copse. There, John claims the girl fell, hitting her head on a stone and falling unconscious. While this was likely a lie, what happened next was undebatable. Straffen closed his hands around Brenda's throat, strangling her to death before leaving her lifeless body out in the open as he continued to the cinema to watch the film shockproof as if nothing had happened. During the investigation, perhaps recalling the incident with the young girl four years prior, John quickly became a suspect with police contacting his employer to confirm his whereabouts. This contact quickly led to Straffen's dismissal, no doubt ratcheting up his hatred of the authorities. Days later, on August the 3rd, he would come face to face with those he saw as his tormentors as he was brought in for questioning. Brenda's foster mum said she saw a man walking down the road after she left the house to look for her child. Straffen admitted this was him, but that in and of itself was insufficient to arrest him and he was released without charge. Sadly, this would allow John to strike again. On the evening of August the 8th, Violet Cowley, the wife of a police officer, was out walking her dog when she spotted a man wearing a dark blue suit walking with a young girl in a field. While she was married to a police officer, she had no knowledge of John Straffen, but news of Brenda Goddard's murder had left the community on edge, and so the strange pairing stuck in her mind. It would later be revealed that the two people in the field were Straffen and nine-year-old Cicely Batston. The pair had met at the cinema at a children's showing of Tarzan and the Amazon Queen. After the film ended, he convinced Cicely to go with him to see another film in a different cinema. He had managed to gain the young girl's trust, so when he suggested they go for a walk despite initially feeling uneasy, she eventually agreed with the pair boarding a bus to a nearby meadow known as Tumps. There, they were seen not only by Mrs. Cowley, but by a courting couple who were also walking through the field. Once they were out of view, Straffen placed his hands around the girl's neck, strangling her to death before leaving her body in the open. After this heinous act, he nonchalantly walked home, buying fish and chips along the way. It seemed John cared little about his victims, but it also seemed he didn't care about the fact multiple people saw him with the young girl. Perhaps because, in his mind, he wasn't doing anything wrong. Mrs Cowley had informed her husband what she had seen in the field that evening, but there seemed to be little to act upon. This would change the next morning when Cicely was reported missing. Violet led the police to the field where the young girl's remains were soon discovered. Her description of the man she had seen with Cicely quickly resulted in detectives paying a visit to the home of John Straffen. He was again brought in for questioning, but seemed to show little emotion. 
When first asked about his movements the day before, he openly admitted to meeting a girl at the cinema and traveling with her to a field. According to his story, however, she had told him she was tired and so laid down. He then stated that he left her there and went home. Having questioned him previously, the officers decided to leave Straffen with his thoughts for a while before questioning him further. This seemed to work as when they resumed questioning, Straffen not only told them that he had strangled Sicily, but asked about Brenda, admitted that he had, quote, done her the same. He seemed to relish in telling the police of his actions, so much so that taking into consideration his mental ability, a detective asked him if he knew how serious his position was. He began laughing before stating, quote, Don't you see? The girls are dead, but you cannot prove I did it. They might have seen me in the field, but no one saw me kill them. End quote. Despite feeling that he had just played an ace, that he had confessed to police, and that many people had seen him either with the girls or in the locations where their bodies were found, meant that the case against him was solid to say the least. On October the 17th, 1951, John Straffen stood before Mr. Justice Oliver for the murder of Cicely Batstone. In the days and weeks since his arrest, he had shown no remorse for his actions. Stood in the docks, despite being some six foot tall, he cut a pitiful figure, chin resting on his chest, eyes fixed forward but empty. It's likely he understood little of the conversation as Dr. Peter Parks explained to Justice Oliver his belief that due to John's feeble-mindedness, he was unfit to plead. With this, Justice Oliver turned to the jury and stated, quote, In this country, we do not try people who are insane. You might as well we try a baby in arms. If a man cannot understand what is going on, he cannot be tried, end quote. With this, instead of being sentenced to prison, John was transferred to Broadmoor Hospital, where he was to be held indefinitely. There, he seemed to settle in well, making friends and spending his days doing chores and playing card games. Despite this, he still held his deep hatred for the authorities, along with his desire to cause trouble for them. As the weeks progressed, he devised a plot to escape and run off to Manchester. On April the 19th, 1952, he put this plan into action. While on cleaning duties, he pretended that he needed to shake his duster off outside. Since he had been relatively well behaved to this point, the person in charge saw no issue with letting him into the grounds by himself to complete this task. Once outside, however, John would quickly scale a shed built onto one of the outside walls, using this to help him reach the top of the 10-foot barrier. Once atop, he would lower himself as far as he could before dropping to the ground and escaping. While some sources claim that he was the first to escape, this isn't true. Only a few years prior, in 1937, a man named John Edward Allen had escaped and remained on the run for over two years. Straffen's period outside the walls wouldn't last as long. In fact, his escape would last only hours. However, it was enough time for him to take another life. Once out of Broadmoor, he made his way through woodland, over fences and through people's gardens until he reached the small village of Farley Hill, some seven miles away. There, he wandered up and down the high street searching for something to drink before he happened upon a young girl riding her bike. This was five-year-old Linda Boyer. John followed the girl before telling her that he was friends with her father and that he was to take her to get some tea. With this, he led her into a nearby field and took her life. By this point, authorities at Broadmoor were aware of their missing patient with police out in force, and just over four hours after his escape, they would have their man. They discovered him behind the Bramhill Hunt pub with a group of children. 
Upon seeing the officers who had come to take him back, he tried to make a run for it, but was eventually subdued. Asked why he was with the children and if he had been up to his old tricks, John replied, No, I only escaped to show I'm innocent. I've given up crime. The next morning, Linda Boyer's body was discovered in the field yards from her bike. Detectives immediately made their way to Broadmoor to question the recent SKP. When asked whether he had gotten up to any mischief whilst he was outside, John replied, quote, I didn't kill her, if that's what you mean. I did not kill the girl with the bicycle, end quote. Officers had not, to this point, mentioned the discovery of Linda's body, and so John quickly found himself charged with her murder. The fact he was able to escape so easily and take a life caused great anger across the country, with magistrates deciding he be held at Brixton Prison until his trial was to take place to ensure he'd not escape again. His trial began on July the 21st, 1952, with the question of his sanity being left for the jury to decide. The evidence against him was massive, with his defense being almost solely based on character witnesses attesting to his mental abilities, or lack thereof. To counter this, the prosecution called forth an expert in mental deficiencies who stated Straffen had told him that murder was wrong because it was against the law and was one of the Ten Commandments, seemingly proving he knew wrong from right. With this, on July the 24th, John Straffen was found guilty by the jury, also meaning they found him able to stand trial in the first place. The judge, Mr. Justice Cassells, sentenced him to death. The date of his execution was set for September the 4th, but he would never hang. Despite his heinous crimes, newspapers began to report on whether it was correct for a country to hang a person with such obvious mental defects. It was revealed that back in 1951, electroencephalograph tests done at Bristol Hospital showed John had suffered wide and severe damage to the cerebral cortex, probably from an attack of encephalitis in India before the age of six. He never exceeded the mental age of a 10-year-old, with others believing the answers he had given during his trial were only learned actions he had picked up while in the system. Giving answers he felt the quizzer wanted rather than ones he understood. These, combined with a growing movement against capital punishment, led to John Straffen being reprieved by Home Secretary David Maxwell Fife. He would instead serve a life sentence, and as Broadmoor had proven ineffective in holding him, Straffen was sent to Wandsworth Prison. Over the years, he would be moved between several other prisons and even be involved in another escape plan, though inmates only planned to use him as a diversion. Despite attempts to have him released in the 90s and early 2000s, John Straffen died in Franklin Prison in 2007, at the age of 77. At the time of his death, he spent a then record 55 years, 3 months and 26 days incarcerated. After his escape, an alarm system was installed and security stepped up. Very much a case of too little, too late. Please do. Let us know your thoughts on this terrible tragedy in the comments below. Right then, take care, and I'll see you next time with another story to make you say, well, I never.